Good morning, all Yiddish Kinder. Today is Thursday, and it's Lamet Cheshvan. Now, on average, you have Lamet Cheshvan every three years or less. Because according to the calendar, the months are staggered, starting from Tavis. Tavis is 29 days, Shvat is 30, Adar is 29 days, um, Nissan is 30 days, and there's an extra other, by the way, the extra other always gets 30 days, always. Um, behave. Rabbi, I lost him. Let's see if it's still here. No, he's still here. Uh, Ian is 29, Sivan is 30, Thomas is 29, Elul is 30, that's how it goes. Every other month is 29 and 30. So, so Elul is 29, Tishrei is 30. Cheshven and Kislev are the two months that are moody. Sometimes they're both 29. And when Cheshven and Kislev are both 29, it's called a Shana Chaseda. If you'll see the count of Hava Ches, it's missing a day because Elul, because Cheshven is 29 and Kislev is 29. Then you'll have some years that they're both 30, like this year. This year, Cheshven is 30, so Kislev is going to be 30. It's called a Shana Malaya. So they'll be in the calendar, a letter Mem. There's an extra day in the calendar. And then sometimes Cheshvan will be 29 and Kislev will be 30. And then you'll have in the calendar a Chof, which means Kisidon, in order. Because if you go in the order of the month, Tishrei is 30, Cheshvan is 29, Kislev is 30, Tevis is 29, and so on. So the way it plays out, realistically speaking, is our year has either... 353 days, 354 days, or 355 days. If it has 353, then Cheshun and Kislev are both 29. If they have 355, Cheshun and Kislev are both 30. And if they have 354, Cheshun is 29 and Kislev is 30. Or, if you have a leap year, so it's Shin Pei Aleph, Shin Pei Bey, Shin Pei Gimel, 381, 382, or 383. If they're both 29, it's 381. If they're both 30, it's 383. If Cheshun is 29 and Kislev is 30, it's 382 days. But it's never 30 days in Cheshvan, 29 days in Kislev. It doesn't work that way. So two-thirds, Cheshvan usually only has 29 days, which means usually Kislev is only one day to Shavish. When the Rebbe had his heart attack in 1977, there was one day to Shavish, it wasn't two days to Shavish. So they had one day to party. <laughs> we got two days, we got 48 hours. We got every other year, every third year approximately you have two days to Shavish. Somebody said to me, so which day do you celebrate? I said, Celebrate bro, what do you got to lose? Celebrate the Rebbe's Gesund. So today is the third day of the month of Cheshvan. It's Av Rej Chedesh Kislev. And uh, for all kinds of reasons, I'm talking to the whole Zal, as opposed to just my class. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about Chedesh Kislev. And uh, the one advantage I have is I get to choose what to talk about. Right? There's so many things to say. And what I decided to do with you now here is tell the story of Rish Chedesh Kislev. Just tell you the story, that's what I'm gonna do. I, I have to preface by saying that I have a dear friend who is a descendant of a very special chassid who was involved directly in the Rebbe's healthcare. So he sends me a message last night. Rabbi, I listened to your story of Rish Chedesh Kislev. It's full of mistakes, full of inaccuracies. So I sent him back, please correct me. Please tell me my mistakes. <laughs> I get back. When I find my grandfather's tape, so that's the end of that story. So I can only tell the story the way I remember it, and the way I heard it, and apparently I have some details incorrectly, and God has to forgive me, and you have to forgive me, but I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm not deliberately misleading, and I hope I'm not exaggerating. You need to understand that the had his heart attack, I was 12. Now 12 is big, but I was a distracted 12-year-old. I don't know how to say this without incriminating myself, but I wasn't paying that much attention to 770 when I was 12. It's just the way it was. I was busy with Shtusim. Um, but I was around, and I was a Babacha boy, and I went to 770. So I, I, I was a part of what was going on from a little bit of a distance. <coughs> I have personal memories of that episode, a few personal memories of that episode, which I'll share with you. The most acute personal episode, the most acute personal episode is um, Shmini Atzeres, I did not go to Hakafis. I, I forgot my excuse was. I probably was sick in my head before I, I didn't go to Hakafis. I didn't go to the Rebbe's Hakafis. My father came home with my sister. 
And it wasn't that late. Our coffee used to finish by 10 o'clock, 10.30. They walk into the house, and my sister says, you know what happened? And my father says, shh, shh, don't say anything. This was, so I, we got it out of my sister. You know, my father was, his approach was, be quiet. The other thing that I remember very distinctly about that period was, Matzah Yom I remember my mother, my father was whispering to my mother, I was 12. My mother was always home. She was never out, she was never away from us. And I remember my father shushking to my mother and trying to get us into bed. But at some point, Matzah Yom my father and mother both left the house. And I remember being very upset. You know, my parents never left together, so I wouldn't have to stay home. I mean, listen, I was 12 years old, my sister was 14. We didn't exactly need babysitting, but I felt abandoned. When they came back and I heard what happened, I was angry. My father and mother said, I need to hear that sikh. They announced Matzah Yom Tif. Rabbi Chandakov came downstairs after Abdullah and he said, there may be news later. So my father says, my mother, come, let's take a walk. My mother doesn't come from a Lubavitcher family. She became more and more Lubavitch over the years. And at that point, she was probably halfway, you know, or more than halfway. And my father says, Brother Kam, let's take a walk. He didn't want us to know why they were going. My father sort of sensed that there was going to be a sikha. He wanted to be there, and he also wanted my mother to be there. So he left us home, because if he had taken us, my mother wanted us to home because we had little kids. And he took my mother to the sikha. And I remember how upset I was at missing the sikha. And the truth of the matter is I'm the most upset. I push it wasn't. Shmini says I was not in show. I'm going to tell you the truth. Those are two personal memories. There are more personal memories, which I either will or won't tell you because they're not that important. But I'll tell you one other personal memory, okay? And I'll give it to you with the full confession, okay? The Rebbe Fabrengt, when I was growing up, a lot, often enough. And we went to Fabrengens. We didn't really sit. We sat on a bench. And there was usually not enough room to sit on the bench. So we sat on the top of the bench. And we got two big, sitting on top of the bench. We sat on my father's lap. My father used to sit in a fabrink with a 12-year-old on one lap and an 11-year-old on another lap. And we were not the easiest kids. Um, I, I think about it now. My brother thinks about it now. The Messiah is nefesh. He took us to every fabrink and he wouldn't take up a spot. If someone needed a seat, he didn't say, my kid is sitting here. He put his kid on his lap. And we, in quotes, were always running to the bathroom. We had all diarrhea. Every Fabrega diarrhea. Why? Mm-hmm. Fabregas were boring. Then I sat for three, four, five. I mean, I was a kid that was running for six hours also at night. 9.30 to 3.30 was, was perfectly normal in the 70s. And we would <laughs> go to the bathroom, and then we'd disappear for like an hour or two. My, brother, my father would send my brother to go find out what happened to me in the bathroom, and he would disappear. Anyway, that's how it was. That's the reality of it. So there was a Fabrega in Chai 1977, Toshin Lamed Zayin. And I went to the bathroom. I wasn't in the bathroom. I was just bored of sitting on my father's lap in the middle of a crunchy fabrengen. I'm ashamed of it. Don't misunderstand. I'm not proud of it. I was a kid. I didn't understand the word. I didn't understand the word that I was saying. I knew Yiddish, but I didn't understand the Rebbe. Anyway, and the Rebbe starts to sing Tzama L'chanafshi. This is Chai Yelul Tov Shin Lamed Zayin. In other words, one month and four days before the heart attack. The Rebbe sang Tzamo a few times a year. It was not uncommon for me to hear the Rebbe sing Tzamo Lecha. The Rebbe sang by himself. Tzamo Lecha Nafshi. And the Rebbe did it from time to time. When, as an adult, when I look back at those moments, I realize how serious. The Rebbe said Tzamo Lecha Nafshi. Tzamo Lecha Nafshi is not a happy niggin. Tzamo Lecha Nafshi is describing Be'eretz Tziyev Oye Belimoyen, which means in plain English, my life's rotten and miserable. <laughs> this is what the Ebsheh gave me. And this was the Rebbe's nigger. When the Rebbe wanted to say something from his heart, he said, Tzamal And it was a couple of times a year the Rebbe sang Tzamal It was a normal thing. And by the way, in the 80s, I, I forgot at what point, he basically stopped singing it. The Rebbe just stopped singing Tzamal Khanafshi. And I don't know the reasons. It was, he almost never sang it. But as a child growing up, every year there were two or three occasions. He never knew when. The Rebbe just sang Tzamal. And we would all sing with him. We couldn't appreciate I certainly couldn't appreciate what the Rebbe was saying when he said, the, the loneliness that he felt, because that's what the Nigan describes. So it's Chaya, I went to the bathroom, I remember exactly where I was standing. I was behind the bleachers on the, on the, king, on the, on the Mizrach side. <laughs> Whatever. I remember exactly, I could see where I was. And the Rebbe sings, so okay, I wasn't so 
out of the loop that I wouldn't sing along. You know, it's something, ay, 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 ay. Then Cain, Ba, Koi, Desh, the Rebbe sings it different than us. And he changed the words. He changed the words. Instead of singing, Liris, Uscho, Chodecha, the Rebbe said, Liris, Nafshi, Yukvedi. So I stopped. Because I didn't hear what he said. And the whole room, you could feel that people were uncomfortable. Then they sing it again. Kein ba koi desh chazi si yichol. You can hear the tape, by the way. Aya ya nafshe yochvei de di. The Rebbe said it twice. Twice, instead of saying lides uschoch vedacha, the Rebbe sang lides nafshe yochvei di, which means instead of seeing you, I'm going to meet me. That's how you translate the words. Lides nafshe yochvei di. I'm going to meet my own soul, my own honor, rather than. <coughs> Your strength, right? Uscha means yours, about Hashem. Now, Rabbi Lipska downstairs told me, and this I don't remember, but again, you can hear it on the tape. Everything is available on audio tape, which means you don't have to trust anybody. You can get it firsthand. When the Rebbe finished singing the Nigan, he started again. And usually the Rebbe only sang Tzom al once, and then we would sing it ourselves many times. But on this occasion, the Rebbe changed the word, Lirus Nafshi Yochveidi, twice. And then when he sang it a second time, he sang it Correctly. People, I mean, you see, this is the thing about the Rebbe. This is going to sound so silly, but it's so real. You couldn't control this man. You couldn't, he did what he wanted. He was usually predictable, but every once in a while, he did something that was really, really disturbing. And it would happen so fast. And it was done so without tumult. The Rebbe didn't give you 45 minutes notice. Hey, by the way, I'm going to make a mistake in the words tonight. You know, pay attention, that kind of thing. It just would happen. And it would happen so quickly that you could forget it. But you're dealing with a Jew, with all due respect, we're dealing with a Jew who knew everything. There's no other way to say it. The Rebbe knew everything, and we knew it. And when the Rebbe would do these kinds of things, the mature wise amongst us I don't know if the right words would get nervous, but they would get very thoughtful, you know. The Rebbe should do something like this. It, it, was, it, was not a, it wasn't a mistake. The Rebbe didn't make a mistake like that, especially since he did it twice. The kids, forget about it. Why? Because it, it happened, it only took five seconds. The whole thing was a few seconds. The Rebbe moved on, and otherwise he was the same guy he always was. And I, I have other experiences where the Rebbe made small changes in his behavior that had huge ramifications. They meant big, big things. And because it was so uncomfortable for us, because we didn't know how to eat it, we didn't know where to put it, we just forgot about it. This was Chayel. And again, you know, people always ask, you remember we were standing when Kennedy was shot? I remember where I stood when I heard that. So I'll never forget as long as I live. And again, I, I forgot it. Finished. Next. You know, the Rebbe was, the thing about our Rebbe, Chavre, is he was always healthy and he was always there. The other Rebbe used to travel a lot. The other Rebbe would disappear from, from their shul for months at a time. The Rebbe never went any place, ever. The Rebbe was a fixture in 770. The whole Lubavitch went on vacation. You came in from your mountain retreat. You want to see the Rebbe Mincha? He was always there. But he would do these things occasionally because the Rebbe is a Rebbe and the Rebbe sees Emes and the Rebbe is Emes and he does Emes and he would really, really rock our world. You know, this was one of those little moments. This was Chayelo. Now, the Rebbe used to blow Shefer Rosh Hashanah, as I'm sure you know. The Rebbe used to blow Shefer Rosh Hashanah. According to Jewish law, according to Halacha, when you blow Shefer, two people are supposed to blow together. And Lubavitchers don't even notice, you know, but Apiyah Halacha, two people blow Shefer together. In most communities of Jews, if you've ever seen non Chabad communities, a man stands next to the Baltikeah. And just like by Birchaz Koyenim, before the Koyen says Yevarechacha, the Chazan says Yevarechacha, before the, the Baltikeya blows Tkiya, someone says loud, Tkiya, and then he blows Tkiya. Shvarim Tru, and then he blows Shvarim Tru. That's how it's someone is a Makri. The Chabad custom is that you have to have a Makri. Someone has to do it with you. It's a dinner Shachon Aruch. But our custom is that you don't announce it, you point with your finger. So you go into a regular Lubavitcher shul, someone is blowing Shaifer. To his right is standing a man with his finger on the, on the word, Tkiya, Shvaram Tru, and so on. The Rebbe blew Shefer by himself. The Rebbe did both jobs together. The Rebbe didn't have a makri. Nobody helped him. 
Now, people say that it was a chassid, Rabbi Shmuel Levitin, who used to do it. Rabbi Shmuel Levitin had died four years before. And for sure, those few years, 1974, 75, 76, the Rebbe blew Shaifa without a makri. No one helped him. That Rosh Hashanah, Tavshin Lama Ches, in the morning, the Rebbe comes to 770 and sends a message to Rabbi Tenenbaum, who used to blow the Tkiyas of Musaf. He was about to care about the Tkiyas Mu'umid. The Rebbe wants him to stand next to him by Tkiyas and be the makri. He wants to the point in the Siddur. It was a Kiddush. It was very unusual. The Rebbe should ask for help. That's basically what happened. And from that point forward, Rabbi Tanamal always stood to the Rebbe's right. Now, when you blow Shaif with a regular person, you put your finger on the Tkiah, and he blows the Tkiah, and when you decide it's enough, you take your finger off, he stops blowing, you put your finger in the Shvarim to it. But if you're a Makri by the Rebbe, you're not going to tell the Rebbe the Tkiah is long enough. You're not going to tell the Rebbe, okay, stop Rebbe and move on to the next sound. So if you're a Makri by the Rebbe, what you do is, you put your finger on the next coil. Meaning if the Rebbe is reading Tkiah, you put your finger on the Shvarim. If the Rebbe is doing Shvarim, you put your finger on the Tkiah. You stay one ahead of the Rebbe. Because you're not going to control the Rebbe how long they're through or it should be. You know, the Rebbe knows what he wants. And I mean, nobody knows the significance of this, but this is a fact that in Tafshin Lamad Chas, the Rebbe asked, again, I'm using very good Rebbe, the Rebbe asked for help. That someone should, until then, he did both together. He was the Makri and the Batakeya, and the Rebbe asked the Rebbe to point with his finger. Parenthetically, and this I find incredibly mind blowing, another small little change that turned out to be very meaningful. In the year of the stroke, Tafshin Nunbez, 1991, so the Rebbe always used to turn to his right. Rabbi Tanabam would stand on the Rebbe's right, and the Rebbe stood on the left. In Nun Beis, the Rebbe turned the other way. He turned to his left, meaning Rabbi Tanabam was forced to stand to the Rebbe's left. And I could still see in my mind's eye how Rabbi Tanabam was dodging. <laughs> he, wanted to get, he wanted to stand in his regular place. The Rebbe made a mistake. <laughs> Instead of turning this way, so Rabbi Tanabam would stand to the right, and the Rebbe would stand to the left, he turned the other way. So Rabbi Tanabam tried to, like, give the Rebbe body language to say, Rebbe, you got to turn the other way. I'm supposed to stand here. Anyway, the Rebbe, of course, didn't know what he's talking about. Both days, Rosh Hashanah and Nun Beis, the Rebbe stood on the right instead of on the left, and Rebbe Tenemam stood on the left. And these kinds of, these small little changes by a Rebbe, which we see as mistakes, are huge. Huge. And the Rebbe had a stroke that year. Now, what's the connection between standing in a different position and a stroke? But in Nun Beis, there was a hundred things like that. He made small changes that... You know, by themselves, okay, he did it different this time. But when you add it all up, you see that the Rebbe sees things that we don't see. So the Rebbe asked, Rabbi Tanam to help him with the Yitzkiyas. <laughs> Tisha was a regular Tisha, Yilam was a normal Tisha. Right? You may have seen there's a video of the Rebbe coming into Shul, and they're singing, Allah Sela Hochach, and the Rebbe's wearing his talus, and he turns around, and he's clapping, and he's encouraging the singing. That was the same day that the Rebbe had the heart attack in the morning. Hashan Rebbe, Tosh Lamad and the Allah cell law goes on and on and on and on. We understand now, based on what people have told us, that the Rebbe was having chest pains for weeks. When they opened up the Rebbe's kapata after the heart attack, his shirt was completely frayed. He'd been massaging his chest. The Rebbe was in a lot of pain for weeks before, the whole Tishrei. But the Rebbe's tolerance for pain was not normal. The Rebbe's ability to hide pain was extraordinary. My father told me that he went to the same dentist as the Rebbe. And the dentist said, if you knew how much pain your Rebbe was in over the last 48 hours of Shemir and Sassim He said, it's not humanly possible for a human being to manage that kind of pain. And the Rebbe just went on like normal. You didn't have no idea how much pain the Rebbe is. And the only thing the Rebbe went to the dentist for, by the way, was to pull his teeth out. The Rebbe didn't put fillings in. The, the doctor said, my father told me, the, the, the Rebbe may be a great rabbi, but I'm his dentist. And if he doesn't start brushing his teeth, he's going to lose them. By the time I remember the Rebbe, he had no teeth. Not a tooth. And when he talked, it sounded like the Rebbe was, had normal, the Rebbe didn't use dentures. No one but the Rebbe's speech, the way the Rebbe looked. You know what happens to people take out their dentures? Their fate turns into a prune. The Rebbe didn't have teeth, and he didn't put in dentures, and he looks normal, he sounds normal. Without teeth to speak, is extraordinary. These were the everyday miracles that we saw, and we got spoiled by them. But anyway, the Rebbe was in an enormous amount of pain. For weeks, the Rebbe had a, his heart was bothering him. And the Rebbe understood medicine, he understood the heart. And he didn't tell anybody. Um, there's a rumor, which is more than a rumor, it's more than a rumor, that in 1964, the Rebbe had a heart attack at some point. And he told no one. Maybe he told the Rebbe, he didn't go to any doctors, he pushed it, treated himself. The reason we know this is because when the Rebbe had his heart attack in 1977, the doctors took 
x-rays of the Rebbe's heart. They said, you had a heart attack before. <laughs> he said, yeah, in 1964. And the Rebbe, when he had that heart attack, he didn't even slow down. Nobody even realized. Imagine a person have a heart attack and just keep working like as if nothing happened. The Rebbe made changes then. The Rebbe did slow down. The Rebbe used to have Yechidus three times a week. And at that point, he changed it from three times a week to twice a week. But could you imagine a man has a heart attack and he's such a public person. You see him five times a day and no one knows. The ability of the Rebbe to manage pain and to put on a front of, 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 of the king was extraordinary. So the, apparently the Rebbe had been having chest pains for weeks before and, um, and he continued trucking like nothing. You have to understand what Tishri looked like. A whole day he shined it up. The Rebbe gave cake. He stood a whole day on his feet giving out honey cake. I, I, I stop and I think about the cake and I, I can't believe the Lubavitch Rebbe had nothing better to do in his time than give you, look into your eyes, give a little piece of honey cake and say, Lishon Teva Masukah. A good and a sweet year to every Rebbe and the Rebbe and Bobe and Bobe and boy and girl. Anybody who wanted, the Rebbe stood by him with his kapota and his gatl and his silks and took and he gave out honey cake. So the, of course, the Rebbe, the Rebbe went home and shot an Abba to eat. You know, Bechlal, Jewish people have to eat, yeah? They have to hold their giving cake. Uh, and the Rebbe went home to eat. I heard once that the Rebbe used to say that when my husband comes home after giving lekach, Erevim Kippur, he has no koyach. He doesn't have koyach to put the food in his mouth. He has no koyach to eat. The Rebbe called 770, that's the rumor. And he said to the secretary, the Rebbe doesn't feel well. Please make that coffers quick. Now you can't make a coffers quick. The Rebbe does what he wants. You can't, <laughs> you can't rush the Rebbe. You know, the Rebbe knew that the Rebbe didn't feel well. She saw. Anyway, the Rebbe came to Shul. A very large coffers. Might have was 7 o'clock, whatever it might have was. At 7.15, the Rebbe left the Shul. Her coffers started at 8.30. That was the same day. She not said it was by night. And a coffers usually lasted from 8.30 till about, I don't know, 10, 10, 15. It wasn't that long. In the middle of the fourth Akafa, before the first Akafa, the Rebbe turns around to label Groner, all over Shalom, and he says to him, if it's not difficult, can you bring me my chair, please? The Rebbe never sat down in the middle of Akafa. Never. He stood the whole time. And the Rebbe turns to label Groner between the Akafa, he's facing the walls, if you don't mind, bring me my chair. But people who saw the Rebbe's face saw that something was really wrong. The Rebbe's face was ghastly white. In other words, he turned this way, which is in the direction of the crowd. And he was talking to Label. But people who saw the Rebbe's face, saw the Rebbe's face was, was white like, 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 like snow. And it had fallen in. The Rebbe looked very bad. And Label saw that. Label Groner saw that. So he brought the Rebbe the chair and he pushed it into the Rebbe's feet so the Rebbe should know where the Rebbe sat down and he leaned back, which the Rebbe never did. The Rebbe was very clear something was wrong. So the people close were alarmed and they started to make noise. Everybody doesn't feel well. 770 is a basement without a single opened window. <laughs> and the air conditioning then didn't work particularly well. So uh, they started to scream that the Rebbe needs air. So there's, I guess, two things going on. The Rebbe sits down. There, there were a lot of doctors in the room. Well, there were a lot of people in the room who knew medicine. And as soon as they saw what happened, they understood that the Rebbe is going through an episode. So they came running to the front. On the other hand, they're screaming, everyone get out, the Rebbe needs air. So 770 cleared out. I don't know how long it took, but people left the show. Only a few hundred people stayed, everybody else left. A man went around and broke every single window in the Viber show on both sides. So there should be air coming in. There was no windows in 770. The women's section is above ground, so there's a door. You open up the doors to the women's section, and you break the windows to the men's section. The women's section will be a little easier for the Rebbe to breathe. He broke every single window in the Viber show. And, they, you know, and uh, the doctors examined the Rebbe. The doctor went to the Rebbe. They say a doctor picked, uh, tried to touch the Rebbe's pulse and the Rebbe smiled. The Rebbe was so aware of his public image and he didn't want to frighten us. So he didn't allow the doctors to do anything in front of the chassidim that would demonstrate on his part weakness. Uh, the doctors told the Rebbe, you're having a heart attack. They told the Rebbe, you're having a heart attack. And the Rebbe, I'm sure, understood that himself. And there were different things that doctors did. One doctor took the Rebbe's hat off. He started to fan the Rebbe. Because people have a heart attack, their body overheats. It's like a car in overheating, you know. And the Rebbe smiled, took his hat, and put it back on his head, like, don't help me, you know. <laughs> Another doctor came brought the Rebbe orange juice. Because uh, people have a heart attack, I think, orange, citrus fruits. I don't know why that works. but the, So the Rebbe said, first of all, I'm before Kiddush. Second of all, I'm not in this, okay? Forget about it. Um... 
So they wanted the Rebbe to leave the shul. They said, no, we've got to finish HaKafas. Might have, HaKafas. There was, the crowd was very small. So the Gaboyim, when they realized that the Rebbe was not going to leave the shul, they just made it happen quick. And I think at this point, the Rebbe allowed it to go quick. There was a fourth HaKafas, there was a fifth HaKafas, there was a sixth HaKafas, and the seventh HaKafas, the Rebbe went himself. And the Rebbe just had a heart attack. Now, people who have a heart attack, again, I, I don't know about this personally, Baruch Hashem, but the way I understand, you have a heart attack, your body becomes like a rag. You have no kayak. Rebbe walked to the middle of the shul, holding his invitator, and started dancing with his brother-in-law, the Rashag. Now normally when the Rebbe danced with his brother-in-law, the Akafa was short because his brother-in-law, the Rashag, would dance with the Rebbe looking up at the ceiling, straight up at the ceiling. And he would get dizzy. So the Rebbe's Akafa, when he danced with the Shvaga, the Rashag was always very short. But very short is 10 revolutions, you know, 10 times around or 12 times around. But this time the Rashag went around once and the Rashag stammered. The Rashag, he, he acted like as if he got dizzy much more quickly than he normally did because he didn't want the Rebbe to dance. They went back to his place, Olenu, and left the show and went upstairs. So the way I understand the story, it's very hard to know the order of the details, but the Rebbe went into the room. He locked it in the kind of way that nobody could get in. In other words, people had keys to the Rebbe's office, but they only had the key, I guess, to one lock. The Rebbe locked his door in such a way that you couldn't open it from the outside. So they knocked on the door. And through the door, the Rebbe says, I'm fine. I'm just very tired. I didn't eat the whole day. I'll be, I'll be better in the morning. Look, go, leave me alone. But everybody understood that that was not the case. But the Rebbe's not opening the door for anybody. Not Chadikov. I mean, Rebbe's personal secretary. So they pulled off a coup. They brought the Rebbe's sister-in-law, Barry's mother, who later fought against the Rebbe's Bashar Shasvarim. She lived in 770. She was the Fidi Gibb's daughter. She was the Rebbe Shvegerin. And then she came downstairs. And she knocked on the door and she called the Rebbe's first name. She called him by his name. And the Rebbe opened the door for her. She walked into the Rebbe's room, and they had probably told her. The way I heard the story was the Rebbe's room was always full of books. Thank you, thank you. The Rebbe's room was always full of svarim. <laughs> and every surface had piles of books. I mean, the rumor even goes that on the floor, the Rebbe's put on a push on a piece of paper and a pile of svarim. The Rebbe's room was never clean. Moon bays before the stroke, the Rebbe cleaned his room spotless. Spotless. But the Rebbe's room was always a mess. When the Rebbe had yachidus, they had to just move things to the side. There was svarim all over the place. So the Rebbe had a number of chairs in his room. Every chair was a, had a pile of books. That was always learning and looking at a million svarim. He never had time to clean anything up. When she walked in, the Rebbe picked up a huge pile of svarim, put them on her table, after having a heart attack, so she should have a place to sit. Just to tell you about, about the, the will of the Rebbe, the strength of the Rebbe, and if I may use this word, the gentlemanliness of the Rebbe. Anyway, she talked to the Rebbe for a minute or two, thank you. And uh, she told the Rebbe that the Rebbe doesn't feel well, that you have to see a doctor. And the Rebbe said, I'm fine. I didn't sleep. I didn't eat. I'm exhausted. I'll be fine tomorrow. She argued the Rebbe for a few seconds. I don't know how the conversation ended, but she walked out. When she walked out, the Rebbe slammed his door. But the label put his foot in the door. The Rebbe didn't, he didn't let the Rebbe close the door. And they came into the Rebbe. The Rebbe has to be again by doctors. Doctors come and see the Rebbe. And uh, I, I guess at some point the Rebbe agreed. Now understand that while this is all happening, somebody ran to President Street and knocked on the door and told the Rebbe that the Rebbe is not feeling well. So she came to 770. And that was the game changer. Once the Rebbe and Chaim Mushka showed up in 770, and by the way, she lived in 770 so long as the Rebbe lived in 770. Until the Shredish Kislev, she lived upstairs. She stayed in her grandmother's room. In the Fidik and Rebbe's apartment, there were two bedrooms. I was in that apartment many times as a child. Now everything is locked with gates. We used to walk into the Rebbe's bedroom. We couldn't lay down on the Fidik Rebbe's bed if we wanted. There's two bedrooms. There's a bedroom with two beds, the Fidik Rebbe and the Rebbe Hamadina, and there's a bedroom with one bed that belongs to the Fidik Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Sishtana Sada. She passed away 81 years ago. That bed is still sitting there from 81 years ago. The Rebbe Tzachayim Mushka slept in that bed for the month or so, five weeks, that the Rebbe was sleeping in his office. She stayed upstairs. When she came, she really took charge. And, and first of all, she was the Rebbe and second of all, she was Schneers. She was, she was not just the Rebbe's in the name, she was the Rebbe's. And she, she really made things happen the way she wanted. Everybody bent to her will, and she took charge. She was one person, and the treatment that the Rebbe got, and the respect and the privacy that the Rebbe needed was her credit. She made sure that 
She didn't let five people cook the Rebbe's soup, you understand? She took charge. And doctors started to come. Uh, a guy told me he was standing in the hall. And she, she went into the Rebbe's room. I'm sure you've been in the Rebbe's room. I would imagine you've been in the Rebbe's room. If you walk to the Rebbe's room right by the door to the right, there's like six or seven or eight uh, light switches. And then there's a bookcase. Under those light switches, there's a chair. She sat down at that chair by the door. And she was basically Shemir Adela. She stood by the door. He said, I'm standing outside. I hear the Rebbe saying, Groner, Rabbi Klein. She started to push him around. The secretary, you do this, you do this. She came and took charge. And, and that's really the miracle of Lama. It's one of the miracles of Lama Tchess. And doctors started to come to examine the Rebbe. You have to understand, it's now it's 9 o'clock at night. It's not 2 o'clock in the morning. It's 10 o'clock. It wasn't very late. And they started calling some of the biggest cardiologists in New York. And they started to come. They all came. And of course, the Rebbe was very nice to them, and so on and so forth. And they examined the Rebbe, and they said to the Rebbe, you're going to have another heart attack. And the one you have is like the tremor before the big earthquake. There's going to be a big one. And you need to get to a hospital pronto, because nobody can treat you here. And the Rebbe said, I'm not leaving 770. I'm not leaving 770. The Rebbe actually said, at some point during that night, Quote, which means in English, if something has to happen, it should happen here. There's no need to explain. I mean, the worst thing had already happened. They never had a heart attack. If something is going to happen, it's going to happen. I'm not, I'm not leaving 770. And of course, the way the story is told is that the doctors got really upset. They brought big doctors. New York City has one of the best doctors in the world. And they were woken up from their sleep and made rush to Brooklyn by police escort to come and examine the Rebbe, and the Rebbe's not going to the hospital. How do you treat a man without machines? And one or two or three, I don't know many, got really upset. And some of them, we know their names. And they would leave. Well, I can't take responsibility for you. This is ridiculous. One of them started to scream at the Rebbe. I, I, I saw or heard a description. One guy was shouting at the Rebbe, and some guy grabbed him and pushed him up against him and said, listen, you're a big doctor, but I don't know if you know who you're talking to. And with all due respect to you, you can't talk to him this way. And they left. So a few things went on during that night. Uh, let me just say this. At some point, the Rebbe went out to the sukkah to make Kiddush. I don't know how long it was after he went into his room. But remember, the Rebbe wouldn't eat or drink out of the sukkah. The Rebbe went out to the sukkah. And the Rebbe went with him. The Rebbe went into the sukkah, the Rebbe made Kiddush for himself and the Rebbetzin, and he ate Mazenus, and the Rebbe drank an oil, they brought the Rebbe grape juice. <laughs> they brought the Rebbe grape juice. <laughs> and the Rebbe said, this isn't it wine, this is juice. This is not wine. This, he didn't say grape juice, it's juice. So that they bring the Rebbe wine, they made Kiddush on wine, and he drank a lot of orange juice. I mean, for the Rebbe, orange juice just me a half a cup, you know, but the Rebbe, well, the Rebbe ate like a bird. By the way, it's a bad expression, eating like a bird, because birds eat pound for pound more than any other animal on earth. Birds have very high metabolic rates. Eating like a bird is a misnomer. Birds eat a lot, much more than other animals of the same size. They need it for the energy to fly. But okay, that's just a little yente uh, shaft. They ate very little. He, and he went back into his room. When he went back into his room, the whole front of 770 was people. The people came to 775 coffers. They left the shul because they never didn't feel well. And now they didn't go home. The whole shul is waiting outside. What happened? What's going on? And the Rebbe turns around and there's hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people just waiting and looking. So with the Rebbe's, all of his kaiches, he starts doing this. That was all zingin. And the Rebbe was in so much physical pain. And you have to also assume that he was pretty exhausted. He wasn't, did a lot of koyach. But he didn't want the chassidim to worry. At some point, somebody actually came out and said an official word that the Rebbe doesn't feel so good. Go home, have to this yomtif, enjoy your family, come back in the morning, something like that, to that effect. Um, eventually, eventually means within an hour or two, people knew that it wasn't just that the Rebbe didn't feel, but the Rebbe had a heart attack. And guys walked to the oil. It's a six hour walk. They walked to the oil. I heard the Biel walked to the oil. They walked to the oil. And then they came back, they walked back from the oil to find because they couldn't miss what was happening. Anyway, so one of the things that happened was, People got on the phone. They had connections. That are shocked. Deb's brother got on the phone and he started making phone calls, and they basically brought the hospital to the Rebbe. The doctors who were there, 
They may not have been heart specialists, but they understood medicine, and they said, if the Rebbe's not going to the hospital, we need to bring the hospital to the Rebbe. And they got from local hospitals, downstate hospital, some of the most modern equipment for, for cardiology. You know, cardi this, this is 45 years ago. Medicine has advanced enormously in the last 45 years. But even then, it was pretty, they brought the best machines. The doctors who said that the Rebbe must go to a hospital would say later that if they knew that the Lubavitch had the ability to bring the hospital to the Rebbe, they would never have asked him to move because the worst thing you can do to a patient is move them. But their understanding was that if you're going to keep the Rebbe in 770 where there's no machines and there's no ability to monitor him and he's going to have a heart attack, they're not going to be able to take care of him. But the machines were brought to the Rebbe. And the doctors later said, yeah, you know, if you could do this, then this is actually better. And they kept looking for a doctor. <laughs> Nobody wanted to shoot the Rebbe, they kept looking for a doctor. And there's a lot of little anecdotes that happened that night. Uh, one of them is that Dr. Feldman, Dr. Feldman was a local doctor, he was a young man in the Fiyarach. He, was a, he lived in Kran Haitu. He visited Kran Haitu at that point. Dr. Feldman just recently passed away. Dr. Feldman was a young doctor. This is 45 years ago. And he went into the Rebbe and he tried to reason with him. The Rebbe said, go to the hospital. And the Rebbe said, Dr. Feldman, he says, you see these walls? Pointed. You see these books? These walls and these books have absorbed the tzadis of thousands of Yidden. They will heal me. And so he told him, you see these books, you see these walls, they've absorbed the pain of so many Yidden. They will heal me. So of course, you know the story that Rabbi Krinsky says, that the Rebetzin walked into the Mosquitoes. Wait, there's a first story. The Yudel Krinsky, the Rebetzin walking down the steps from the second floor to the first floor. Like as if everything is like cool. And Rabbi Krinsky says to the Mrs. The Rebetzin, we have to take the Rebbe to the hospital. And the Rebetzin says very, very coolly, who was up my man? What is my husband saying? Your husband doesn't want to go. And the, the idea was they wanted to convince the Rebetzin that she should overrule the Rebbe, that she should fool the Rebbe. And the Rebetzin says, if my husband doesn't want to go to the hospital, we're not taking him to the hospital. And he says to the Rebetzin, the Rebbe's life is in danger. And the Rebetzin said something to the effect that my husband, as long as I know him, which is almost 60 years at that point, he's always in charge. He never gives away his will. If you're going to defy him and force him to go to the hospital against his will, that could be worse than the heart attack itself. You're going to break him. And the Rebetzin said, if my husband does not want to go to the hospital, he's not going to the hospital. And she was the only one. Every Lubavitcher, all the most big chassidim, felt that the Rebbe has to be forced to go to the hospital. And the Rebetzin, who was his wife, said, if my man doesn't want to go to the hospital, he's not going to the hospital. Case closed. Conversation over. And then there are, of course, there are different expressions that I heard. I heard once from Chaim Gutnik, all of Shalom, that they said to the Rebbe, the Rebbe has to go to the hospital because his life is in danger and so on and so forth. And that what they wanted to do was that the Rebbe should agree that they would give the Rebbe sleeping medication. And when the Rebbe fell asleep, they would take him against his will. And the Rebbe said, this is what I heard from Rabbi Gutnik from Australia, I married him for almost 60 years. I've never once upset him. Never once upset him. <laughs> I mean, you guys are mad. You have parents, right? <laughs> so you know how impossible. I've never once upset him, and I have no intention of upsetting him now. So they told her, he'll be upset for a while, and then he'll appreciate what you're doing because you're saving his life. And she said, I will not do that even for a moment. Even if later he's going to appreciate it, I'm not going to do something against my wife. Which was for one second. From somebody else I heard who was, was there, he was standing in the hall. He didn't see, but he heard. The door was open. They said to the Rebbe, the Rebbe has to go to the hospital. His life is in danger and the whole thing. And the Rebbe said, if my husband doesn't want to go, he's not going. And they tried to quote, convince her. <laughs> and the Rebbe said, in all of her schneers and toughness, was mein man will, will ich. What my husband wants, I want. Conversation's over. Was mein man will, will ich. What my husband wants, I want. Nothing to talk about. And that's what happened. And again, the stories are that they gave the Rebbe enough sleeping medication to put to sleep a minion. <laughs> to put to sleep ten men. 
and he wouldn't sleep. He wouldn't sleep till they promised him that they're not going to move him. That the promise him they were not going to move him into sleep. And then the Rebbe slept. And of course, the way the story is told, the Rebbe slept for four hours in a row. And the Rebbe said, I've never saw him sleep so much, ever. We're married 60 years, I never saw him sleep. Four hours, four hours, that's an afternoon nap for me and you. And <laughs> a summer afternoon. Fear Shah, I never saw him sleep so much. And of course, the story, Rabbi, it's the kind of, the, the, you have to, it only lasts for half an hour, you got to do something again. So what happened was, the, the story of Akrinsky tells us that the Rebbe walked, the Rebbe Tzanchaya Mushka walked into the mosquitoes. And all the phones are running. There's no Yomtev in, in that room. You know, they're calling doctors, they're calling uh, medical suppliers, they're bringing the hospital to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe Tzanchaya Mushka says to Rabbi Krinsky, you, Rabbi Krinsky, you know so many people. You cannot find one doctor who will treat my husband as my husband wishes to be treated. And at that moment, you will remember Dr. Weiss, Dr. Ira Weiss. Now, Dr. Weiss today is probably 75. I doubt he's 80. I think he's younger than my father. So how old was he 45 years ago? 30. 30? He was a young doctor. He was a good doctor. He was a cardiologist. Um, he was a from man. He had a shaykh hastalabavich. He learned from Rabbi Hecht. He had actually published some kind of a, uh, some kind of a medical piece. And somehow it ended up in the Rebbe's room. And when Dr. Weiss came into the Rebbe, the Rebbe showed him that he had in the file cabinet, he had written something on medicine, on heart, on cardiology. The Rebbe had it in his room. They called him, he was living in Chicago. They got him on the phone. I mean, doctors, it's so weird, but doctors pick up the phone on Shabbos. You know, we don't pick up the phone, doctors pick up the phone on Shabbos. And they told him what happened. And he says, okay, I'm getting on the first plane. I'm coming to New York. But the Rebbe needs to be stabilized. I'm not going to get there for another, whatever it is, 12 hours, 14 hours. You have to get to the airport, you buy a ticket to Chicago, to New York. He says, I have a professor who was my teacher. I'll call him and I'll tell him the situation. I'll explain who the Rebbe is. He'll come. And until I get there, he'll, uh, he'll treat the Rebbe. And he called Dr. Tischholz, who lived in New York. He was an older doctor. And he explained to him the situation. Dr. Tischholz came to him in the middle of the night. But he was told that the Rebbe is not going to the hospital. You've got to deal with those specifications. And he, was, he did it. And Dr. Y says that he saved the Rebbe's life. He, quote, stabilized the Rebbe. The Rebbe did have another massive heart attack. Massive heart attack. And the Rebbe was being monitored. The Rebbe was already on a cardiogram. They had a, then it was a big Kiddush. You know, there was no wires, remote. There were, today, everybody's remote. And every, there were no wires, you know. And they were monitoring the Rebbe's heart. The Rebbe was sleeping. The door was closed. It was quiet. And they could see that the Rebbe, they went into the Rebbe, they told the Rebbe, you're having a heart attack, can we give you an injection? The Rebbe said, yeah. And they gave the Rebbe some kind of injection. The second heart attack was massive. Dr. Weiss says, on a scale of one to 10, the Rebbe had a 10. And here's what you need to understand. When a person has a heart attack, the heart tissue is damaged permanently. It doesn't repair itself. It's like scar tissue. You know, when you get a cut, you get a scar. Scar tissue looks different than regular tissue because it's not healthy tissue, it's, it's dead tissue. When a person has a heart attack, the part of the heart that's damaged is damaged permanently. If a person has a massive heart attack, most people don't even survive it. But if you do, you have less of a heart. A much sm you, you, the ability of your heart to pump blood and to oxygenate the body is reduced substantially. So people who've had a big heart attack are from that point forward, they're weak. They're pushing weak, they don't have kayak. And the Rebbe resumed full function like as if it didn't happen. Which is impossible to explain. The Rebbe's heart was damaged. Um, the Rebbe's heart didn't get fixed. <laughs> the Rebbe just fixed. But the Rebbe's heart was severely damaged and he went back to full function. You know, Dr. Weiss tells the story. It's mind-blowing. He says to the Rebbe, you understand, Rabbi, that the damage to your heart is permanent. And you're going to have to curtail your, your work schedule. And the Rebbe says, why? I read something about stem cells. You heard of stem cells? You ever heard of stem cells? I'm an Atzim Gmurim. Stem cells are cells that don't have a specification. When a baby is conceived, at the very, very beginning of pregnancy, there are stem cells. Stem cells means they're cells that are not, the body has different kinds of cells. You have hair cells, you have skin cells, you have nail cells, you have heart cells, you have eye cells, you have brain cells, you have blood cells, you have cells, every, every part of the body has different kinds of cells. They start out, in a hiuli. <coughs> Stem cells means non-specialized, not specified cells. 
that will then turn into the body parts, the cells the body needs. So there's a big, big area of research to develop stem cell research. If they could, they, haven't st they still haven't figured out, it's 45 years later. If they could figure out how to use stem cells, they could actually repair your heart. Why? The heart, the, the, the heart cells that were affected by the heart attack are dead. Stem cells will become new heart cells. And the biggest area where this would benefit is if, if you could repair brain cells, which don't re regenerate very quickly. People who have Alzheimer's or dementia, where the brain cells are damaged, if you could repair those cells, you can give a person back his memory, his life, his mobility, everything. So the Rebbe says to him then, why am I going to have to live in a broken heart? They, they have the stem cell research. It was stem cell research most likely didn't even know about. And the Rebbe was up to date. They didn't know exactly what was going on in medicine. 45 years on, doctors have still not figured out. They're trying very hard how you can take stem cells and inject it into a person's heart and have those cells repair the damage to the heart or the damage to the brain or damage to the eye, the parts of the body that the cells do not regenerate very quickly. Anyway, but the Rebbe's recovery was incredible. Um, I heard from somebody that the doctors told Rabbi Groner that every 15 minutes he should open the door and look at the Rebbe. Because they really, they really expected the worst. They really expected the worst. So I heard from Rabbi Groner's relatives that four or five months later, one day out of the blue, the Rebbe says, you know, the nightish man says, you kept walking into my room every 15 minutes, you kept look at me. Why were you doing that? <laughs> and what was Rabbi Groner going to say? So the Rebbe says, I, I know exactly why you did it. Because what they told you, right? Look at me now. <laughs> Look at me now. That was the Rebbe's observation. Look at me now. Anyway, the Rebbe got through that night. Dr. Tischholz came, and he stabilized the Rebbe. And like I said to you before, they did bring the hospital to the Rebbe. And they treated the Rebbe. And because of the Rebbe, it's in really, the treatment that he got from Lama was extremely private and extremely respectful. <coughs> What they did was they blocked off the second half of 770, the last part of 7, they put tables in the shul and on the sidewalk. So nobody should walk in the back of the shul and no one should walk in front of 770. They did that probably because they don't, they don't people looking into the windows. But they also did it because they wanted it to be quieter. And it, it was quieter because the area around the Rebbe's room was cordoned off by tables. You couldn't get in. Not you couldn't go into the building. You couldn't go into the sidewalk in the front and on both sides. They sort of demarked an area that they felt that Rebbe needed that Rebbe should have quiet. Um, and then I guess things began to take on a more normal order. First of all, the Rebbe sent messages to the Hasidim that they should continue celebrating Yom Tov and that they should go that night with Simchas Teda, the Babaji to go to the shuls, to Mesameh Achit, and said you have to go to the shuls and continue doing the holy work that you normally do as if nothing happened. Um, and the Rebbe himself was resting. The Rebbe was really resting. Um, that day, Shemir Atzeres, they made a minion. And the, the, the minion was outside, and it was in his office. I think the Rebbe got an aliyah sitting down. And Shemir Atzeres, and the Rebbe cried, but he made the bracha. Um, after davening, Rabbi Kazanowski went into the Rebbe. Rabbi Kazanowski was a big chassid, a very special chassid very close to the Rebbe, and he was crying. And the Rebbe says to him, you want me to have a refuah shleima? Like this. If you want me to be better, you have to be positive. You have to be besimcha. <laughs> this is not going to help me. If you want me to have a refuah shleima, be positive. And then there's little stories, you know, little stories that they tell about the Rebbe. Little stories that happened over the course of those 48 hours. Uh, one of the little stories is that one of the doctors was giving the Rebbe some kind of an injection. And you've, get, you've gotten needles before, right? So how do they go? They have little glass bottles that's like rubbery top, and it doesn't leak, but he pokes the needle through that rubbery top, and he pulls out fluid from the bottle, from this little vial, into the syringe. I'm sure you've seen it a thousand times, right? Yeah. So the Rebbe's watching this doctor pulling fluid from a vial into a syringe against gravity, right? The bottle is here. And the syringe is he's, he's pulling on the needle, and the, the liquid is going upwards. Everything's supposed to go down. The liquid's going upwards. So the Rebbe asks the doctor, as if the Rebbe didn't know, the fact that the fluid is going up into the needle, is it because of a suction or because of a vacuum? In other words, is there actually a force that's pulling the liquid up? 
or is it simply because there's an empty space with no air, mm-hmm. and nature abhors a vacuum, we have an empty space that's going to be filled. In other words, it's low, less density, the bottle has air in it, the vial has air in it, and the syringe doesn't have any air, so the fluid is going to it, there's less air because of the vacuum. So the Rebbe asked, is there a force that's pulling liquid in, or is it simply the empty space? So the doctor says to the Rebbe, it's the empty space, there's no vacuum. The fluid goes against gravity, not because something is pulling it, but because there's an empty space, the space gets filled. You going to say something? Uh, suction is a force, vacuum is an empty space. I'm sorry. So the Rebbe says, this is a lesson. This is a lesson. What's the lesson? That the very fact that the Rebbe is not present makes the chassidim more drawn to him. And he sent someone downstairs to repeat this. But the Rebbe just learned the lesson from the, from the syringe that it's not a suction, it's an empty... You have a hollow. The fact that the Rebbe is missing only strengthens the connection with the message of Hira. That the fact that the Rebbe is not in shul only strengthens the relationship between the Rebbe and, and, and the Hasidim. Um, I heard a story, I don't know if I should tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway, yeah, that the Rebbe is in his room and the Rebbe had a massive heart attack and they see that the machine is acting funny. The Rebbe got up and got out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning, she went to and took a walk, which is impossible. The Rebbe was in so much pain, he was so exhausted, and the Rebbe had something to do, so he went and he did it. The doctors couldn't believe it. How does a man have that kind of kayak and that kind of will? A kid said, so Shmina Teres by day, we went to the shuls, we danced. I remember that night, Takafis, and this time I was in shul, I wasn't going to miss it. It was very surreal, strange. The back of the shul was empty. And the, the mood was so bittersweet. We were dancing and singing and crying. It was really strange. And we were singing, The Rebbe soll gesund sein. The Rebbe soll gesund sein. The Rebbe soll gesund sein. And at some point, somebody came downstairs. And uh, he repeated something that happened upstairs. I forgot what it was. Where the Rebbe indicated that he's feeling better or something or other. So we all got very excited. And then we started singing, the Rebbe is gezon, the Rebbe, that was the sang a whole night. The story was that the doctors were very worried about the Rebbe's ability to rest because it was noisy. Even though they put fences around, it was noisy, a lot of people. And the doctors told the Rebbe that if the Rebbe wants, they could send the chassidim to a different shul to do our coffee, so it could be quiet in 7 and 7, they were able to rest. And the Rebbe said, the noise is quiet, is, it's music to my ears. The noise is music to my ears. And he was very happy that the chassidim were dancing. Um, I can only tell you what I know, right? What I don't know, I cannot tell you. Matzah Yomtev, Matzah Simchas the Rebbe Min Havdala. After Havdala, he sent down his wine for Kesha Bracha. Rabbi Chadakov came downstairs with the Rebbe's Kesha Bracha wine. I forgot how they did it. The bottom line is uh, Kesha Bracha normally you got from the Rebbe directly. It was given out in such a way that within five minutes of Kesha Bracha, Rabbi Chadakov announced right after Yom Tov, people should stay tuned as Ken Epizayin. Maybe something is going to happen. He didn't specify what. I think close to midnight. I don't know exactly what Close to midnight, the Rebbe's voice came on. And like I told you, my mother and father abandoned us and went to listen to that Sikha. You can hear the audio. I don't know, it's seven, eight minutes. The Rebbe is very emotional. The Rebbe cries. And the Rebbe addresses what is going on. You know, that because of certain situations, we're not together. And in those few minutes, the Rebbe crunched the entire Fabengen of Simchas Tere. He spoke about all the things he spoke about. The Shtikl Maimir. He spoke, the, doctor, the, the story was that the Rebbe asked the doctors to be able to speak. And of course, after a heart attack, speaking is more difficult than climbing stairs. And the doctor said to the Rebbe, it would be really good if the Rebbe would rest. And the Rebbe said, but I want to speak to the Chassidim. How long would you like to speak? The Rebbe said for five minutes or seven minutes. They let the, they let the Rebbe speak for seven minutes. I think they spoke for 20. <laughs> Whatever they gave me, it took three times as much. And he, 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 it was a very special to hear the Rebbe's voice. Um, I just want to tell you something. I'm sorry, it's after nine o'clock. I, I have so much more to tell, but I guess I have to stop. Um, okay, want me to do that? Okay, so let me just finish with this. That one of the things about Lamed Ches 
which is undeniable, is that when the Rebbe got sick, the entire Jewish world was shaken. Shaken. The importance of the Rebbe was felt in every community. Chesidim, Emesnagdim, Sfardim, Ashkenazim. And the Rebbe's illness mattered to everybody. You know, the Rebbe wrote a letter a few days afterwards saying that you know, with the help of Hashem and because of the Tefillah Sarabim for the many who daven for me, in Lamet Ches, all Yidin Satilim for the Rebbe, Mamish, even the biggest Misnagdim and the first of business Atmere, there was a very strong understanding that we need this Rebbe. And the whole world cried out, and the Rebbe wrote in the letter, and the Schus of the Tzilas Rabbim, I had a Refua Shlema. And I, I'm just going to mention to you two episodes which are important to me. There was a Yid in Kran, his name was Betel Weiss. Betel Weiss lived in Los Angeles. And he was, he was a Lubavitcher, he, was he became a Lubavitcher through Rabbi Leitchik. And Betel Weiss, there was, in LA at that time, there was a Hasidic Rebbe. He just lived in Los Angeles for a few years. He was a real tzaddik, a no jokes tzaddik, about Moifes, about Kaidish. His name was the Rimnitzer Rebbe. The Rimnitzer Rebbe lived in LA probably from 1975 till 78. When the Yeshiva Oral Khanan opened, almost at the same time, he moved back from California, moved to New York, he moved to Muncie. But he lived in LA for a few years and he had a shtibel. He was about Moifes Goli. This guy knew, he, was, he did miracles, he knew everything. He was, he was you know, like the, the stories in the times of the Baal Shem Tov. He was one of the few in our generation who was in that way. He was an incredible man. He was a Russian Jew. Had a very strong relationship with the Rebbe. The Rebbe had sent him to Russia a Siddur and a Tanya. And he used it till the day he died. He held on to the Siddur the Rebbe gave him. It was one of his precious possessions. He was, he was not a Lubavitch, but he had a very strong connection to the Rebbe. Battle Weiss got a guy to call L.A. and to go into the room and the Rebbe and tell the Rebbe the Rebbe had a heart attack. Now L.A. is three hours behind us. I don't even know if it was Yom Tif yet. But the Rimitzah got word at the beginning of his Yom Tif that the Babachi Rebbe had a heart attack. He was wearing Big Day Shabbos, wearing his Shtraimel, whatever they wear in those communities. He took off his Big Day Shabbos. He put on his Big Day Choyl. He took out a Tillim, probably the Tillim the Rebbe gave him. He said, the Babachi Rebbe filled this git. And he said, Tillim. He cried. He said, Tillim. There was no Akafas. The way I heard the story, which is hard to imagine, but he said, Tillim for the whole 48 hours. I don't think that's literally true, but that's all he did. There was no rock office by the Nimitz Rebbe. After Simchas Teira, they told him that the Rebbe is feeling better, the Rebbe is alive, he's feeling better. So he put on a shtaimu, and he did rock office. And the other thing I want to tell you is, again, I'm telling you the stories because the stories mean something to me. That uh, there was one of the great Misnagdash Gedolim who lived in New York. He was a real god, a real god. His name was Yankov Kamenetsky. He was Rosh Hashiva of Tervedas. He was an incredible Talmud Chacham, a real, real top God. And uh, he was a Misnagid. He would visit Florida for this winter. He was an old man. I mean, he lived till 100, Kimat. And um, when he came to Miami, the Lubavitch Yeshiva Miami tried to, they asked him to come to Yeshiva. He one year came and he spoke at Kinnis Teda, he spoke at Yeshiva, he gave a shiit. But when the Rebbe had his heart attack, they wanted that he should write a letter endorsing the Rebbe's Mephisoyim. They got Ramesha Feinstein to write a beautiful, beautiful letter endorsing the Rebbe's Mitzvahim. And they asked Rabbi Yankov to write such a letter also. They, they felt that it would be good for the Rebbe to see that he has support from a broad base. And Rabbi Yankov said to them, I can't write such a letter because I disagree with the Rebbe. He had a look at Asat Meshita by being Makata Flaya people. He said, But I want you to know that every time I daven, when I get to Shmakelenu, I say, Menachem Mendel ben Chan al It's It's a simple story, but if you understand who he was, and he was a misnagad, they understood. Misnagadahin, misnagadahin, this Rebbe we need. Okay, we'll continue to tell him it's a shame.